Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Hamilton, the president of BOMA Ottawa. And although we can't get together as we normally do at this time of year for the annual BOMA holiday lunch, I wanted to take a moment before our presentation to thank all of you for supporting us through a most unusual year. BOMA is an organization that offers many programs to its members, professional development, advocacy, recognition of excellence, but we are probably most famous for the networking opportunities we provide. Even in 2020, a year that made the whole world take a look at how it does things, we still host, hosted all of our committees to share their experiences and ideas. We hosted webinars to keep our members informed, and we tried to stay connected with you through our newsletters and bulletins. We continued to partner with our national organization, BOMA Canada, to bring you BOMEX, and with the Ottawa Real Estate Forum hosting its first virtual conference, we will publish with our partners at the Ottawa Business Journal, a commercial space directory for this year. This brings us to today where we have assembled BOMA members to bring you a fun event to try in some small way to fill the space where our holiday lunch would be. I wanna thank our cast who volunteered their time and embraced the spirit of this holiday season to animate this table read of a timeless classic. I especially wanna thank Peg Gallison for being the creator, organizer, and director of this idea. Only a few of us will know how hard she worked to make this happen. In a way, this broadcast sums up the spirit of what BOMA is. Although we're an industry association, there is a fellowship amongst those who are in this industry, especially in this city. We look at each other not as competitors, but as colleagues and friends and often refer to our membership as the BOMA family. Again, we appreciate your sticking with us in 2020 and want to assure you that we are working hard to bring you a program worthy of your continued support in 2021, no matter what obstacles are put in our way. On a final note, there is one BOMA tradition that will not be affected by these challenging times, our seasonal toast to all of you. So please, it's afternoon, join me in raising a glass and offering a toast to you, your families, your employees, and to BOMA. I wish all of you the best for all holidays and a safe and happy new year. Now, Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye now. Welcome to this very special BOMA Ottawa Holiday Table Read. Today's holiday read features It's a Wonderful Life, voted the number one most inspiring film of all time with the endearing message that no one is a failure who has friends. Frank Capra's heartwarming masterpiece continues to endure 70 years after its initial release in 1946. Capra wrote the script at the Waldorf Astoria in Palm Springs. The movie starred Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey. Henry Fonda, arguably Stewart's best friend, was also considered for the role. Fonda, however, was cast in John Ford's My Darling Clementine, which was filmed at the same time that Capra shot It's a Wonderful Life. Rounding out the cast was Donna Reed as Mary Bailey. A long list of actors were also considered for the role of Mr. Potter before Capra settled on Lionel Barrymore. Barrymore had worked with Capra and Stewart on his 1938 Best Picture Oscar winner, You Can't Take It With You. We'd like to thank and acknowledge our supporting partner, Every Post Janitorial Services, a leader in single source building services and operations. We hope those of you enjoy this beloved classic in HD table read format. Now, from Boma, Ottawa, and Every Post Janitorial Services, it's a wonderful life. Series of shots of various streets and buildings in the town of Bedford Falls, somewhere in New York State. The streets are deserted and now snow is falling. It's Christmas Eve. Over the above scene, we hear voices. I owe everything to George Bailey. Help him, dear father. Joseph, Jesus and Mary, 
Please help my friend, Mr. Bailey. Help my son, George, tonight. He never thinks about himself. That's why he's in trouble. Please, God. Something's the matter with Daddy. Irma pulls up through the sky until it is above the falling snow and moving slowly toward the space full of stars. As the camera stops, we hear the following heavenly voices talking, and as each voice is heard, one of the stars twinkles brightly. Hello, Joseph. Trouble? Looks like we'll have to send someone down. A lot of people asking for help for a man named George Bailey. George Bailey, yes. Tonight's his crucial night. You are right. We'll have to send someone down immediately. Whose turn is it? That's why I came to see you, sir. It's that clockmaker's turn again. Oh, Clarence. Hasn't got his wings yet, has he? We passed him up right along. Because you know, sir, he's got an IQ of a rabbit. Yes, but he's got the faith of a child. Simple. Joseph, send for Clarence. A small star flies in from left of screen and stops. It twinkles as Clarence speaks. How's it going, old guys? You looking for me? Yes, Clarence. A man down on Earth needs our help. Ah, splendid. What, uh, is he not well? No, worse. He's discouraged. Hmm. If you're going to help a man, you will spend some of this time getting acquainted with George Bailey's early life. Scene fades out. We pick up the story with a flashback to George and Sam Wainwright on top of a snow-covered hill. On this day, George saved his brother Harry's leg, rescuing him after tobogganing into the river. Weeks later, George makes his way into Mr. Gower's drugstore where he works. It's old-fashioned and dignified. We see Mr. Gower, the druggist, taking a drink from a bottle. George turns to notice a telegram. We regret to inform you your son has died suddenly of influenza. Stop. Mr. Gower fumbles and drops a bottle and a bunch of capsules on the floor. George picks up the bottle, noticing it reads poison. Mr. Gower, you don't know what you're doing. You, you've put something in those capsules. It's poison, I tell you. It's poison. Oh, George. George, what have I done? I'm no good. Thank you. Thank you for your help, son. George vows Gower to never tell a soul. Scene fades out. The scene opens to the Bailey dining room. The family is celebrating Harry's high school graduation. Harry and his mother come out of the kitchen. Harry is carrying a pie in each hand and balancing one on his head. Gangway, gangway. See ya, Pop. You coming later, George? You have a good time tonight, son. Well, now, 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 Dad, did I act like that when I graduated? Well, you know, George, we wish we could send both you and Harry to college. You know, we have it all, all, we have it all figured out, you see. After, after I leave Harry, Harry's going to take the job at the, at the building alone, and, and, and I'll work there for four years, and, and then he, too, can, can go to university. George decides to join his brother Harry at the dance. At one end of the room, an orchestra is playing. We see Mary turn around. She sees George. She loses her poise, staring at him. The big Charleston dance contest is announced. They meet. Oh, Mary, I'm not very good at this. Neither am I. Well, okay, I mean, what can we lose? George and Mary don't notice the floor of the gym is opening. They mistake the screams for cheers. Oh, we, uh, Mary, we must be very good at this. They move backwards until they reach the edge of the floor and fall into the pool below. George and Mary still dancing in the water. The others leap into the pool. Fade out of high school. Fade in to George and Mary walking home that night. The evening is warm with a bright moon. Buffalo gals, won't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight and dance by the light of the moon? Oh, 
What is it you want, Maria? Do you want the mood? Just say so. I'll, I'll throw a lasso around it and I'll pull it down. Uh, hey, hey, that's a good idea. Maria, I'll give you the moon. Headlights flash into the scene and the old Bailey automobile drives in with Harry at the wheel and Uncle Billy beside him. They inform George, Peter Bailey, their father has died. Oh, Mary, I, I'm sorry. I, Mary, I, I have to go. The scene returns back to Franklin and Clarence in the stars. So what you're telling me, if I can pull this mission off, you're gonna get me a set of wings, is that right? I've been waiting for over 200 years, you know, and people are starting to talk. Clarence, you do a good job with George Bailey and you'll get your wings. Now you're talking, buddy, thank you. Bailey Building and Loan. First board of directors meeting after Peter Bailey's passing. There are 12 prominent directors seated around the table. Prominently seated among them are Henry F. Potter in his wheelchair accompanied by his goon. Uncle Billy and George are seated among the directors. I think that's all we'll need you for, George. I know you're anxious to make the train. Yes, I, I, have, I have a taxi waiting downstairs. I want the board to know that George gave up his trip to Europe to help straighten things out here these past few months. Good luck to you at school, George. Well, thank you. Now we come to the real purpose of this meeting, to appoint a successor to our dear friend, Peter Bailey. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to get to my real purpose. Wait just a minute now. Wait for what? I claim this institution is not necessary to this town. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to dissolve this institution and turn its assets and liabilities over to the receiver. Honor, you dirty. I'll wring his neck, so help me, George. You hear that buzzard? Mr. Chairman, it's too soon after Peter Bailey's death to talk about chloroforming the building in loan. Peter Bailey died three months ago. I second Potter's motion. Very well. In that case, I'll ask the two executive officers to withdraw. Dr. Campbell rises from his seat. George and Uncle Billy start to collect their papers and leave the table. But before you go, I'm sure the whole board wishes to express its deepest sorrows at the passing of Peter Bailey. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. It was his faith and de devotion that are responsible for this organization. I'll go further than that. I'll say that to the public, Peter Bailey was the building and loan. Everyone looks at Potter surprised. Oh, that's fine, Potter, coming from you, considering that you probably drove him to his grave. Peter Bailey was not a businessman. Oh, I don't mean any disrespect to him. He was a man of high ideals, so-called. But ideas without common sense can ruin this town. Now, you take this loan here to Ernie Bishop, you know, that fellow that sits around all day on his brains in his taxi, you know the guy. I happen to know the bank turned down his loan, but he comes here and we're building him a house worth $5,000, why? Well, well, I, ha I handled that. I mean, Mr. Potter, you, you have all of his papers there, his salary, his insurance, and I can personally vouch for his character. Oh, a friend of yours. Yes, sir. You see, if you shoot pool with some employee here, you can come and borrow money. What does that get us? A discontented, lazy rabble instead of a thrifty working class. And all because a few starry-eyed dreamers like Peter Bailey stir them up and fill their heads with lots of impossible ideas. George puts down his coat and comes around to the table, incensed by what Potter is saying about his father. Now, now I say, well, just a minute. Now, hold on, Mr. Potter. I, you're right when you say that my father was no businessman. I mean, why he ever started this cheap penny ante building and loan, I'll never know. Uh, but neither you nor anybody else can say anything against his character. I mean, why in the 25 years since he and Uncle Billy started this thing, he never once thought of himself. Um, uh, he did help a few people get out of your slums, Mr. Potter. I mean, why, why, 
Or here, you're, you're all businessmen. Doesn't it make them better citizens? Doesn't it make them you know, better customers? I mean, you said just a minute ago, what did you say? That they had to wait and they had to wait to save their money uh, before they could even think of, of affording a decent home. Well, wait, wait for what? Until their children are grown and, and leave them and until they're, they're so old and broken down. I mean, do you know how long it takes someone to, to save $5,000? I mean, just remember that this rabble, Mr. Potter, this rabble that you're talking about, they, they do most of the living and praying and working and, and dying in this community. These, these people are human beings. Uh, they were to my father, but to you, they're cattle. Uh, you know, you're just a, a warped, frustrated, frustrated old man. Uh, well, in my book, you know, the, the, he died a much richer man than, than you'll ever be. I'm not interested in your book. I'm talking about the building and loan. Uh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about something that you, you can't get your fingers on. Well, I... I, 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 look, I, I've said too much. Um, you're the board here. There's, there's just there's just one more thing that this town needs this measly one horse institution, if only for these people to have somewhere to go than to have without having to, to crawl to you, Potter. George leaves the room. Dr. Campbell comes running out. They voted Potter down, but with the condition they appoint George, the executive secretary, to take his father's place. George agrees. We now hear in the distant sky. Yeah, I, I know, I know. He didn't leave ever leave Bedford Falls. We're now a few years later. George and Mary have just been married. There's a gathering of people swarming around the bank doors. Panic is in the air. Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over at the bank. Well, well Ernie, I've never really seen one, but that's got all the earmarks of a run. George runs off up the street towards the building and loan. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, Mrs. Davis, Charlie, what, what's the matter? Uh, can't you get in? Uncle Billy is standing in the doorway to his office, taking a drink from a bottle. He motions for George to join him. Uh, what is this, Uncle Billy? A holiday? Come on in, everybody. Come on in. Now, now look, why don't, why don't you all just sit down? George, can I see you a minute? This is a pickle, George. This is a pickle. All right, now, just explain to me what happened. Well, how does a thing like this ever start? All I know is the bank called our loan. I had to hand over all of our cash. Holy mackerel. And, and then I got scared, George, and closed the doors. I... I, I, I just, I... Well, look, uh, it appears the whole town's gone crazy. Phone rings. Yes? H hello? George, it's Potter. Hello? George, there is a rumor around town that you've closed your doors. Is that true? Well, I'm very glad to hear that, George. Are you all right? Do you need any police? No, the police, uh, what for? Well, mobs get pretty ugly sometimes, you know. George, I've just guaranteed the bank sufficient funds to meet their needs. They'll close up for a week and then reopen. I may lose a fortune, but I'm willing to guarantee your people too. Just tell them to bring their shares. I'll pay 50 cents on the dollar. Oh, Potter, you uh, you never miss a trick, do you? Well, well, you're gonna miss this one. If you close your doors before 6 p.m., you will never reopen. George. George, he's still there. George. Potter realizes George hung up and clicks the phone down furiously. Back to George's office. More people have crowded around the counter. I have some news for you folks. You know, I mean, I was just talking to old man Potter and, and, and he's guaranteed cash payments well, over there at the bank and, and the bank's gonna reopen next week. But, but George, I got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, no, I, I mean, I didn't even ask him. I mean, we don't need Potter over here. 
I'll take mine now. Uh, no, but you, uh, you're thinking of this place all wrong, uh, as if I had the money, you know, back there in the safe. Uh, well, your money's in, in Joe's house, which, is, of course, is right next to yours, and, and then, of course, in the Kennedy house, and, and hundreds and hundreds of others. Uh, why, you're lending them the money to build, and, 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 and then you're going to re repay them, and they're going to repay you the best they can. And, and I mean, what are you going to do? Foreclose on them. I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, sure, Tom. All right, all right. Here you go. Sign this, and, and, I, and I'll get you your money in, six, in 60 days. 60 days? Well, now that's, that is what you agreed to when, when you bought your shares. Well, I just heard old man Potter will pay 50 cents on the dollar for every share you got. Well, George, what do you say? Uh, now, Tom, you have to stick to your, your original agreement. Now, now wait, wait, everyone. Just, just listen to me. All right, now, now listen to me. I, I beg of you. Uh, don't do this thing. If Potter gets a hold of this building and loan, there'll never be another decent home built in this town. He's already, he's already got charge of the bank and the boss line. Let's not forget about the department stores. And now he's after us. Because you know we're cutting we, we're cutting into his business here. That's why, and because he wants to keep you living in his slums, you know, and paying the kind of rent that he decides. Can't you understand what's happening here, Potter? He's not selling; he, he's buying. And why? Because we're panicky. Potter's not. He's picking up bargains. And we've got to stick together and we, you know, we need to have faith in each other. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year and I need money now. How am I going to live until the bank reopens? I've got doctor's bills to pay. I need cash. I can't feed my kids on faith. Well, Ms. Davis, how much do you need? During this scene, Mary comes up behind the counter. She holds up a roll of bills she had saved for their honeymoon and calls out. Hey, I got $2,000. Here's $2,000. Well, well this will tie us over until the bank reopens. All, all right, Tom. Tom, uh, how much do you need, please? Just, just enough to tide you over until the bank reopens. I'll take $242. All right, well, well there you are. And that'll close my account. Oh, Tom, your, your account is still open here, okay? That's a loan. Right. Now, how about you, Mrs. Davis? I have $17.50. 70, 70. He kisses her and continues to loan his customers money. We're gonna make it, George. They'll never close us today. Six, five, Four, three, two, one, bingo! Oh, Uncle Billy, we made it. We're still in business. We've we've got two bucks left. That's right. Let's celebrate. Uh, so I, go ahead and give, give me some glasses. <laughs> We're Rockefellers. Interior bank. Several years later, Uncle Billy is filling out a deposit slip at one of the desks. Potter is being wheeled in by his goon. He is reading a newspaper. Uncle Billy comes to taunt Potter, the envelope containing the money in his hand. Well, good morning, Mr. Potter. Uncle Billy grabs a paper from Mr. Potter's hand. Well, well, well. Harry Bailey wins Congressional Medal. <laughs> How does that slacker George feel about that? Oh, very jealous. He only lost three buttons off his vest. Of course, Slacker George would have gotten two of those medals if he had gone. Why? Because of his bad ear? Yes. After all, Potter, some people like George had to stay home. In a cold rage, Potter grabs his paper and wheels off. Uncle Billy smiles triumphantly as he goes towards the deposit window with his deposit slip. Good morning. Uncle Billy hands the bank book over. The teller opens it, starts to punch it with rubber stamps. Oh, a 
guess she forgot something. Huh? Well, aren't you going to make a deposit? It's usually customary to bring money with you. Oh, shucks. I, I, I know I had it. Interior Potter's office. Potter is now behind his desk. He spreads the newspaper out in front of him, muttering as he does so. He sees the envelope, looks inside at the misplaced money. Back to Interior Bank. Uncle Billy looks around for the money envelope. He looks puzzled, thinks hard, then a look of concern creeps into his eyes. Interior Potter's office. Potter is watching Uncle Billy's panic through the door. Exterior Street. Uncle Billy running across the street in the direction of the building and loan. As George opens the door, he sees Uncle Billy frantically looking for the missing envelope. The office is in a mess. Drawers are open, papers are scattered on the floor and on the desk. Uncle Billy, uh, what's going on? The, the bank examiner is here and, and I... He, he's here? Yeah, yeah. They, they want, the, they want the, uh, the accounts payable. George is suddenly aware of the tragic old eyes looking at him. Uncle Billy gestures nervously for George to come in. He reveals to George he's lost the $8,000. Exterior Main Street. Uncle Billy and George are retracing their steps through the snow, looking everywhere for the missing money. Well, all right, all right. Now, we'll just go over every step you took, you know, since, since you left the house. Uh, oh, okay, we, we, we have to go this way. Interior Uncle Billy's living room. We see a shabby room which has been turned almost inside out and upside down in an effort to locate the missing money. Uncle Billy is seated behind the desk, his head in his hands. Uh, did you put the envelope in, in, in your pocket? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, maybe, maybe. Listen to me. Do you have any secret hiding places? You know, somewhere here, in this house. Uh, someplace you could have put it. I, I have been over the whole house. Uncle Billy starts sobbing hysterically. George grabs him by the lapels and shakes him. Listen to me. Listen to me. Think. I think. I, I, I can't think anymore, George. I can't think anymore. It hurts. Where's the money? You stupid, silly old fool. Do you realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal. It means prison. That's what it means. Uh, one of us is going to jail and, and it's not going to be me. Failing to find the money, George goes home angry and frustrated, yelling at Mary and the kids. He then heads to the bar, gets drunk, and is crashing his car into a tree. The next scene takes us inside the toll house on the bridge with George, Clarence, and the toll keeper. George is seated before a wood-burning stove. He is sipping a mug of hot coffee, staring at the stove, cold, gloomy, and drunk, his problems unsolved. Clarence is seated on the other side of the stove, putting on his undershirt. The toll keeper is seated against the wall, eyeing them suspiciously. Well, I kind of didn't have time to get some stylish underwear at the mall, so my and I tell you, my wife did give me this for my birthday last year, or a couple of years ago. I actually passed away in it. The toll keeper, about to spit, is stopped in the middle of it by his remark. How did you happen to fall in? I didn't fall in, you fool. I jumped in to save George. You, you what? To, to, to save me? Well, yeah, I did, didn't I? You didn't go through with it, though, did you? Where'd you say you come from? Heaven. Upstairs. Yeah, I had to act quickly. That's why I jumped in. I knew if I were drowning, you'd try to save me. And you see, you did. And that's how I saved you. The toll keeper becomes increasingly nervous. Very funny. Uh, George, I think your lips busted up there, buddy. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I got a bust in the jaw and, and, 
in answering to a prayer a, a little bit ago. Uh, no, 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 George. I'm the answer to your prayer, sir, buddy. That's why I was sent down here. How, how do you even know my name? I know everything about you, my son. I've watched you grow up from a little boy. Well, well, who are you then? My name is Clarence Oddbody A.S. Well, okay. What's an A.S.? It's Angel Second Class. The tool keeper's chair slips out from under him with a crash. He's been leaning against the wall on it. Tool keeper rises and makes his way warily out the door. What are you at, my good man? Oh, brother, hey, hey, what's with you? I mean, what, what did you say j just a minute ago? Uh, you, you wanted to save me. That's what I was sent down here to do. I'm your guardian angel, George. No, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I told you, I'm your guardian angel. I know everything about you. Well... You look about the type of angel I get. Uh, sort of a fallen angel, aren't you? I, whatever happened to your wings? Well, I haven't won my wings yet, and that's why I'm angel second class and not first class. Well, I, I don't know whether I like it very much, being seen around town with an, an angel with no wings. Oh, I've got to earn them, George, and you're going to help me, won't you? Oh, sure. Sure, uh, how? by letting me help you oh you you can you can help me there's only one way i mean say you you wouldn't happen to have eight thousand bucks on you would you yeah no no that's not how it works buddy we don't use money in heaven right uh, i keep forgetting that you see it comes in handy down here bob yeah you know you see this here it's an insurance policy uh, I found out a little too late that I'm worth a hell of a lot more dead than I am alive. Now, now look, George, you mustn't talk like that. I won't get any wings out of this with that attitude. You just don't know all you've done if it hadn't been for you. Uh, yeah. yeah. If it hadn't been for me, everybody would be better off. My wife, my, my kids, my, my, my friends. Uh, and look, little fella, can't you just go haunt somebody else, will you? Clarence is not getting far with George. He glances up, paces across the room thoughtfully. Mother Mary and Joseph, this is not going to be easy here today. Oh, I don't know. I guess you're right. I, I, I suppose it would have been better if I'd never been born at all. Oh, you mustn't say stuff like that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, that's an idea. You've got your wish. You've never been born. Poof. What did you say? You've never been born. You don't exist. You haven't a care in the world. George and Clarence approach the tree from which the Bailey Park sign once hung. Now it is just outside a cemetery with graves or houses used to be. Are you sure this is Bailey Park? Oh, uh, I'm not sure of anything anymore. All I know is this should be Bailey Park, but, but where are all the houses? The two walk into the cemetery. George is walking like a lost soul. You weren't here to build them, George. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and drowned at the age of nine. Well, now look, that's a lie. Harry Bailey went to the war and he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. Every man on his transport died as well. Harry wasn't there to save him because you weren't there to save Harry. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Hey, Clarence. Yes, George. Clarence, where's Mary? I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to talk about it, George. No, I'm not. I don't know how you know these things. I don't. But tell me where she is. If you know where she is, you tell me. You tell me where my wife is. George grabs Clarence by the coat collar and shakes him. You're not going to like it, George. You're not going to like it at all. Where? Where is she? Well, George, she's an old Betty. She never married. She has to close up the library. And, oh, geez, there's got to be an easier way to get my wings. We're now on the bridge over the river. George is sobbing. Suddenly, the wind dies down. 
A soft, gentle snow begins to fall. The police car pulls up on the roadway behind him and Bert, the cop, enters the scene. Hey, George, 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 you all right? What's the matter? George backs away and gets set to hit Bert. Now get out of here. Bert, I, I'll hit you again. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for? Bert, 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 do you know me? Know you? Are you kidding me? I've been looking all around town for you. I saw your car piled into that tree and I thought maybe you, hey, your mouth's bleeding. My mouth's bleeding, Bert. Bert, my mouth is bleeding. George touches his lips with his tongue, laughs happily. He practically embraces Bert, then runs at top speed toward town. Well, Merry Christmas, George. George's wrecked car is smashed against a tree. He comes running into shot, sees the car, lets out a triumphant yell, pats the car, and dashes on. George sees that the Pottersville sign is now replaced by the original, you are now in Bedford Falls sign. Oh, hello, Bedford Falls. He runs through the falling snow. He notices that the town is back in its original appearance. He passes some late shoppers on the street. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. George runs by the building and loan. Oh. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, you, you wonderful old building and loan! George notices a light in Potter's office window. Potter is seated working at his desk. George pounds on the window. Hi! Uh, Merry Christmas, Potter! George runs off as Potter looks up from his work. Happy New Year to you! In jail! Now go on home, they're waiting for you. Scene moves to entrance hall at the Bailey family home. The bank examiner, a newspaper reporter, photographer, and the sheriff are waiting in the hall for George. George comes dashing in the front door. Mary, Ma Mary. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Bank examiner. How are you? <clears throat> Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. $8,000? George, I have a little paper for you. Oh, well, I bet that's a warrant for my arrest. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to jail. A Merry Christmas. Uh, where's Mary? Mary! George runs into the kitchen. He gets no answer as he goes. Oh, look at this wonderful, drafty old house. Mary! Mary! Merry Christmas, Daddy. Merry Christmas, Daddy. Kids! Keith. Oh, kids, Janie, Janie, Tommy, all let me look at you. I could eat you up. Where's your mother? She went looking for you with Uncle Billy. Zuzu, Zuzu, my little ginger snapper. How do you feel? Oh, fine. Not a smidge of temperature. Not a smidge. Oh, hallelujah. George, darling, where have you been? Mary, you're real. You have no idea what happened to me, Mary. Well, well, come on, George. Come on downstairs quick. They're all on their way. Mary leads George, who is carrying a couple of kids on his back, to a position in front of the Christmas tree. Come on in here now. Now, you stand right over here, right by the tree. Right there. And don't move. Don't move. I hear him coming. George. It's a miracle! It's a miracle! Who's gonna come, Daddy? Who, Daddy? Oh, I, I don't know, Zuzu. She runs towards the front door. An excited crowd can be heard. Uncle Billy, carrying clothes basket filled with money, bursts in. He is followed by about 20 people. Come in, Uncle Billy. Everybody, in here! Uncle Billy, Mary, and the crowd come into the living room. A table stands in front of George. Uncle Billy dumps the basket full of money onto the table. The money overflows and falls all over. Isn't it wonderful? 
So many faces. Each person comes forward with money in their pockets, shoe boxes, coffee pots, pennies, dimes, quarters, dollar bills. George stands there overcome and speechless. Mary did it, George. She told some people you were in trouble and they just said, if George is in trouble, count me in. The line forms on the right. Merry Christmas. Mr. Gower from the pharmacy enters with a large glass jar jammed with notes alongside Annie, the Bailey's housekeeper. Mr. Gower. I made the rounds of all my charge accounts. Ha ha. I've been saving this money for a divorce if I ever get a husband. Ernie holds a telegraph he just received. Just a minute. Just a minute. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. I just got this. It's from London. Let me read it. You need cash. Stop. My office instructed to advance you up to $25,000. Stop. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas. Your friend Sam Wainwright. The crowd breaks into a cheer as Ernie drops the telegram on top of a pile of money. Everyone, how about some wine? Janie sits down at the piano. She starts playing Hark the Herald Angels. Hark the Herald Angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God in sin and reconciled Joy, glory, In the midst of the scene, Harry in his naval uniform enter, accompanied by Bert, the cop. Hello, George, you old son of a gun. Harry, ah, oh, Harry. Looks like I got here too late. Mary, I got from the airport as quickly as I could. The fool flew all the way down here in a blizzard. Harry, how about your banquet in New York? Oh, I left right in the middle of it as soon as I got Mary's telegram. Ernie hands Harry a glass of wine. Good idea, Ernie. A toast to my brother George, the richest man in town. Once more, the crowd surrounding the Christmas tree breaks into cheering and applause. Janie is at the piano. Tight shot on Mary. She's pointing at a bell on the Christmas tree. What's that on the tree? Well, that's a, a Christmas present from a, a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy. Teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. George looks up towards the ceiling and winks. Not a boy, Clarence. end fade out it's a wonderful life everyone and happy holidays happy holidays everyone happy holidays, holidays. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs>